just okay if uh, we get you on audio? Yes. So uh, I would say take it away, George. And uh, you have. I have. Tick, tick, tick. You have a full block until uh, noon. Well, someone will have to. Actually, we might get up 20 minutes. Yeah, so we're 20 minutes ahead, so we'll okay. call it 11:40. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Lance. Yes, I'm George Hathaway. I appreciate all of you being here, listening to me. I appreciate being invited. I appreciate being in Jim's presence and all yours. Um, and it's, it's an honor. Thank you. Um, I have a strange proclivity about having my face appear on the internet. And that's why I there's this little discussion about, oh, should he be, we should be video him or not. I don't mind you videoing my the presentation, but I just prefer not to have my face on the internet. And there are several reasons for that, and if people are interested, they can come up and talk to me about it later, after the presentation. So um, I am an engineer. I'm an EE, graduated in 74 from the University of Toronto. And I'm not a physicist, although virtually everything I do nowadays has to do with physics in some sense or other. Um, in, uh, I'm also a professional engineer, if that is uh, of, of interest. And I have a little company called Hathaway Consulting Services near Toronto, Canada. You know, that's you know, where we have igloos and, and moose running around. And, and, and white stuff on the ground all the time. Paul, Next, Paul please. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Bob and Doug. Um, could someone, man or woman, the... Thank you. Um, lights are okay? Or... John, to get the full flavor. Um, okay. Next, please. Uh, although the bulk of my talk is going to be about m measurement pitfalls and pratfalls and prosaic explanations for what is seen in the lab, and I'm an experimentalist, um, I, I will give you a little overview to begin with, as, uh, as I had mentioned to Lance, about what we do or what I do uh, in my organization and my associations as well. Um, as you can read there, uh, it's been established for some time. Um, we uh, have a two-phased or a, a two-pronged approach. Um, it's a private organization. We're not associated with any government agency. Uh, we're not uh, funded by uh, any agency um, uh, or, or institution. It's primarily private investors. Uh, uh, private clientele, private foundations in North America and Europe. And uh, the operation is basically twofold. Um, we provide a service for inventors or people who have what we consider a crazy enough idea that it might just be worthwhile looking into and funding. So I will try to attract funding uh, for, um, for inventors. And we also, on the flip side, have a, uh, a service that we provide for investors. So if someone, uh, a venture capitalist, for instance, uh, has, as they do from time to time, quite often actually, uh, some group or person coming up to them and saying, I've got, I've got the answer to space propulsion, or I've got the answer to free energy, or something like that. Or, uh, these are the areas in which I particularly specialize, and they don't know where to go. Uh, a university won't touch it and say, forget it. It's not worth it. It's not within the paradigm that Lance has so uh, uh, adequately uh, described uh, just before my talk. Um, and uh, even the DOD uh, or DARPA may say, that's nah, a little too flaky even for us. Um, then I will, if the investor is, knows about me, they can come to me uh, and, and I will look at the, at, at the invention and say, no, we, we can, we'll provide you that service. Primarily from a 
an experimental standpoint, but also we have theorists uh, that we can call on too. So uh, an IASA here is the Institute for Advanced Studies. If you're wondering how put-offs operation, you may know in Austin, Texas. Uh, we also keep a low profile and virtually zero internet presence, and that saved us a lot of hassle because, as you can imagine, knowing about someone who has the ability to attract funds for wild and crazy ideas is a magnet for all sorts of wild and crazy ideas. <laughs> so, next please. Um, our capabilities have grown uh, substantially since uh, I started off a long time ago. And uh, I, I won't go through all of them. You can read them yourselves. But the reason I'm putting this up is in case some of you folk find that uh, you may need uh, some capability, experimental capability, some hardware capability, some, some um, a possibility of finding a place that has some stuff that would be useful to you, as John and others can attest, mm -hmm. uh, which I will talk about a little later, um, in, in one of your experiments, uh, that uh, you'd like to have a space, I, I'd really li just like to have a gravimeter or a gravitometer, depending on how you want to talk, describe it. I'd just like to sit it on the desk and I'd like to fiddle with it for two weeks or something with my, my, my uh, little experiment. You know, I, I have a little box here and I think it's going to affect gravity, um, but where do I go for someone who might lend me a, a gravimeter for a while? Is there an app for that on the iPhone? <laughs> That's for everything else, right? <laughs> you mean an app for, for gravity for, <laughs> as a gravimeter? Yes, perhaps. Well, I, I would question whether they've got it down to uh, one part in 10 to the eighth or 10 to the 10th. Yeah, let's find out, yes. And anyway, um, so if you have particular questions about uh, some scientific apparatus or technical apparatus that you've been looking for um, and would like to have to spend some time with, and it happens to be available in the lab, it's maybe available, maybe very inexpensive. In fact, if we're not using it at the time, and it's for an advanced propulsion or energy project that I personally or some of my cohorts uh, think is a valuable program, uh, you're free to come up and use it. Uh, and the charge will be minimal or zero, uh, depending on, on whether we're using it at the moment. Um, so the only snag is you have to get your mucklucks on and your parka and, and uh, come up to Toronto. Ooh. It's colder than Wisconsin. It's, 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 <laughs> it's south of Wisconsin, as a matter of fact. <laughs> anyway. Um, if you have any questions about this, you can ask them either now or later. This is a small subset of, of what's available at the lab. The lab is about close to 11,000 square feet uh, of space with um, all sorts of wonderful and bizarre things in it. Um, so we not only can stimulate an experiment by some of the things you see up there, uh, but we can measure the results by some of the things you can see down there. Uh, and we've uh, been um, privileged to also to produce um, some of the piezoelectric uh, transducer crystals that Jim has used or was going to use in one of his experiments. We have a material science lab too uh, where we uh, produce magneto and electro-optical uh, uh, electroactive, I should say, um, ceramics. So it's a ceramics processing lab we have. Um, so, yes, we have uh, various vacuum sintering presses. We have uh, a 600 ton uh, press with a die we made 
if you remember the Podkletnov spinning disk experiment, uh, I published that in 95, I think, where we made six inch um, high temperature uh, YBCO superconductors. Yes. Um, depends on how, whether we set up our, whether it's a Sokrolsky or whether it's a so Miltex. Probably on the order of uh, five or six centimeters, something like that. But that we can, that, that's a actually, uh, uh, crystal growing is something we did a while ago and haven't done it for a while, but that, let us know if you have that problem. Yes, the, the one that I'm listing here is, I think, uh, it's, uh, it's not a particularly, it, it's not automated. You have to actually, there'll be a picture of it. John used it yeah. uh, a while ago. Its sensitivity is about one part in 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th G. Yeah, we were going back when we were looking at superconductor 2, and yeah. the resolution was like in hours, not in seconds, or even milliseconds. It, it was worthless. Yeah, uh, for, for high speed stuff, no, you can't use, this is a quartz. The gravimeter, I think you're talking about, Tony's about, uh, has a tiny quartz fiber with a little platinum weight on it, and you peer into it. And it, it's primarily, it's a commercial device used for uh, surveying, for, uh, for uh, mining and finding, gas finding gas. natural gas and, and outcroppings of sulfides and things like that. But it's still available. So if you have a long-term experiment where you can, it's not a, 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 a pulsed experiment, uh, it can be very useful. And we have balances and all sorts, I mean, things that do react faster but don't have the sensitivity. Next, please. Uh, some of the propulsion experiments that I've been involved with, either designing or testing for someone else uh, at the lab, uh, are listed here. Uh, this is only a subset of some of the other, some of the general stuff we do at the lab, which uh, there's two prongs, as I mentioned, propulsion and energy. So. We've had a long history of involvement with all sorts of folk who have um, come to us with new energy devices. And there's a much longer list than that we've involved, been involved with regard to energy. Um, and at a different conference, I would basically put up the same kind of slides but have an energy, uh, energy section. Um, there are uh, a whole bunch of individual, let's see, individual uh, experiments we've done on force rectification, which is a, an old standby, and a lot of these these particular uh, experiments were mechanically are, are mechanic, pure mechanical devices where people have said, "Well, I've got the gyroscope and." and I put it on the end of a string and it sort of swings over this way a couple of times and it's average, it looks like it's, you know, it's got a thrust in that direction. And when you actually do the proper experiment, um, the average thrust is zero. Uh, I don't know how many people remember Willie Williams or Ferris Williams and his five dimensional theory. Uh, we have, I have uh, pictures of some of this. Um, of some of the experiments we did uh, on, on, his, on his theories. And John's, uh, we did a bit on uh, the rotating currents of GEM. Uh, probably not many people know about a guy named Rudolf Zinser, uh, who had um, a, a theory and an experiment where he claimed that uh, um, if you produce uh, 40 megahertz approximately uh, uh, sawtooth waves and introduce them into water in a certain way and weigh the water, you will get an accumulation of force, uh, of, of force increments, force impulses, uh, which we experimented with. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of, unfortunately, uh, that did not uh, pan out. And, uh, here's something called the Hutchison effect, and afterwards, if you're 
interested in reading about this cannonball levitation, which seems to be a theme so far developing in this uh, conference, thanks to Lance. The cannonball. The cannonball levitated out in front of yeah. the main administration building, not very far. It may, it may be that the cannonball levitation that Lance was referring to uh, was the famous cannonball video uh, levitation produced by a guy named John Hutchison. And uh, I have a, had a close association with John Hutchison writing apparently the only book on Hutchison, <laughs> uh, which is available here. And I will be flogging at the end of my presentation. Next, please. Oh, Tony. I will criticize how it's being publicized. Absolutely. The, 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 the publications, a lot of these experiments that I read, and the impression I get from the reading, reading it is that what that person said would happen is untrue. When real, the, what the experiment has actually done is a subset of what the person did, not the true experiment of what the person did, but yet the article reads as if what that person did is wrong. And, and so you, you need to bring out when you're writing these papers that you're within some kind of uh, limit of the original experiment and not doing the original experiment. But that doesn't seem to be brought out in these papers. It's almost like you're saying you did the original experiment and it didn't work. You really did. Yeah, and, well, for instance, uh, my Podkletnov uh, reproduction was uh, uh, criticized by not saying that I had actually not done the actual experiment and I'd not found the, uh, or, or I'd not said yes or no, there's absolutely no effect, this is not a true uh, representation. Uh, it was, th there are gradations and it, as you're just pointing out, it's not possible to put in all of the milieu in which an experiment has been designed or carried out or the theory has been developed. Um, unfortunately, people don't have that long uh, an attention span or ability to read. Um, anyway, we can come back to that. There, sometimes there's excitement in the lab. And here's an excited daughter, my daughter Nina, um, helping me uh, with some, uh, some uh, power supply uh, installation. And sometimes things get so excited <laughs> that it's just overwhelming. And that's uh, da <laughs> uh, my daughter, Georgia, who was uh, just uh, exhausted after I put her to work, obviously, to <laughs> unpacking things. Um, next, please. Um, some folk might have heard of uh, Peter Granot and his son, Neil. Uh, we spent many years um, with uh, the Grenots, it, principally in their energy experiments. They were suggesting that uh, if you um, introduce a high current discharge from a capacitor bank very quickly into water, the water would uh, around the arc form uh, a huge quantity of fast fog, they called it, and the fog would shoot up through the water and the momentum in the, uh, if you calculate the momentum and then the, the energy in that fog burst, it would be greater than the energy introduced into the capacitor bank to charge it in the first place. Hence, there was some weird over unity energy activity going on, which Neil originally and then Peter uh, ascribed to something called hydrogen bond breaking in the water. Um, that is an energy experiment, but it wasn't uh, generally known that uh, we also did, uh, we considered using this idea, whether it was over unity or not, as a propulsion uh, system. So we did some experiments. Here you can see, uh, is there a, a, um, a, a pointer around somewhere that might? Just a laser pointer. Yeah. Well, all I need is, 
That, that's all I need. Okay. Um, here, Peter, that's Peter there. And we have a high voltage power supply, a pulse power supply there. Uh, and and uh, I don't, John, you can see that too. Yeah. Uh, there's a arc discharge device, a little cannon down there that uh, is going to shoot water or fast fog, which it is certainly fast fog when it comes out of the barrel. Uh, and we're filming it uh, as, as it uh, pushes a projectile up into this uh, little catcher here. <laughs> and, uh, um, this was, uh, uh, it would have been a very interesting uh, propulsion system, even though we were, you know, it was classical, we were uh, pushing stuff out the back and uh, providing uh, forward momentum, but uh, it would have been much more exciting if there had been an over unity uh, component to it. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't. Next, please. Um, here is a, an example of what would be considered the, a granddaddy of gyroscopic propulsion systems. Um, this device stands a, almost a foot tall. It's actually about like that. Actually, the, the, it's about there, the gyro in it, um, or the, the rotor is uh, on the order of seven or eight inches in, whoop, in diameter. Heavens. There, uh, I'm not at liberty to tell you where this was done, uh, but I was involved in testing it. The idea was that it, it was, it's another precessing gyro experiment where the, uh, the hoped for outcome is that if we precess a gyro, a spinning gyro, at the correct the correct ratio of the, the precession or nutation, actually the nutation uh, frequency uh, compared to the spin frequency, you might get the thing to start lifting off or at least lose weight. Uh, that's an old saw that has not proven itself in any experiment that I've ever known or been involved with, but I was involved with this one, and this was a granddaddy, and these guys really went to town with, uh, uh, um, the force gauges underneath and, and all sorts of instrumentation all over the place. And they, ha they were just getting a whole bunch of noise. Isn't that an offshoot of a lathe It is an offshoot of a lathe weight, but it's a more <coughs> developed theory and they put millions high tech into this. Uh, yeah, it sure was. So I made my own little uh, reproduction of it with uh, a, uh, a rate gyro from uh, uh, an aircraft, a uh, World War II aircraft, and uh, spinning, spinning around with a little motor here and doing basically the same as, as that experiment. But whereas this was all super tightly uh, instrumented, um, it, it, was, um, it was not actually allowed to move much. If you go to the next slide, please. So a couple of the ways we experimented with seeing whether there was a force generated was uh, on the end of an optical, uh, on an optical table with a simple arm, and there's the device. And although it would oscillate back and forth, it never, it never progressed in its oscillation. And there's another, um, another way of doing it, uh, of, of looking at, uh, at constant thrusts, uh, which is the ball table. And a lot of people poo-poo uh, this method, but it's actually quite sensitive. Uh, here on this, this is a, um, the, the gray area is a machinist's flat uh, table, which is ground to uh, within uh, tenths of a, of a, uh, of a mill uh, flat, and there's a glass plate here, a strong glass plate on which the experiment sits, and there are balls, like um, uh, balls from a, a, a um, uh, ball, ball bearing race. In this case, they're plastic. And a little card there with a crosshair in the center and a, 
and an arm sticking out. Anyway, this thing vibrated around and moved around and shimmied and shook and and the, the card or the, the pin, this thing is hovering, this pin is hovering over an X on the card and you could just see it tracing this, cir this circular area and never progressing any further. It's like a little spirograph, yeah. And anyway, that's another experiment, please. Uh, this is uh, for those who know the Williams uh, five dimensional theory, his uh, consideration was that if you can produce a strong enough divergent current um, which diverges in one way on a plate, on a conductor from a central point, let's say using a, 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 that kind of divergence, and another plate nearby where the current is converging to a point, according to his theoretical calculations, uh, there should be an area of reduced gravity or increased, depending on how you do it, um, between the plates. So we devised an experiment for Williams where we uh, had a, there would be a um, welding cable coming into this face, or, or to a pin in the center of this face, and welding cable coming into a pin in the center of a face in there, and this phenolic piece was supposed to get heavier or lighter. <coughs> Unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, to the, and we actually were able to measure it uh, down to uh, the weight of this phenolic piece between these diverging and converging plates uh, to um, a, uh, a factor much better than he was expecting. Unfortunately, it didn't pan out. How did you measure that in, in situ? Uh, this, was, this was placed in a, a frame, and there's what you cannot see is a hole uh, on, in, in this, uh, um, this elbow. And we hung, uh, basically the, um, the phenolic was hung on a thread to a very sensitive balance up top. So from the below a balance, a chemical balance was a string or a thread that went down through a hole in the top here, which supported this. And when we turned the current, the current was about 2,000 amps. Um, and we were hoping to see either a weight gain or a weight loss. In, no, it was just a balance, just a chemical balance, one arm of a chem chemical balance. Just had 10 milligram, no, better than, uh, well, well better than milligram uh, sensitivity over the f five or six grams, I think, that was this. Anyway, it doesn't say that there isn't a force or a gravitational interaction uh, because of diverging and converging currents, according to Williams' law. It just means that we weren't able to detect it down to the level that he was hoping to. Next, please. John, when you put that chemical balance, can you see the numbers sort of fluctuating quite a bit? Because I noticed with the chemical balance, they think it tends to take a few seconds for <coughs> a nice reading to settle at decimal places. So if that thing is, yeah. is vibrating at all, isn't it going to be difficult to get it? No, in it? our case, it, it didn't do a thing. It didn't do anything. <laughs> it just sat there. <laughs> Uh, and we tried to make sure that there, uh, the, the phenolic, I think we, we used phenolic, we used mylar, we used uh, so a few th electric. Yes, uh, we, we didn't want, of course, any no magnetic or, um, and, and there, there was not an electrostatic effect. Um, we, we shielded for that too. And here's an august personage. That's him. <laughs> Uh, using one of our uh, um, gravimeters. I learned from this experiment with your, your arriving with your gravity meter that just like a good lawyer, a good physicist never proposes an experiment unless he knows the answer already. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you knew the answer already. <laughs> I thought I knew the answer, but unfortunately it was yeah. a dollar involved. Uh, in, this, <laughs> in this case we have a, 
a three-phase power supply and uh, one of John's uh, rotated current devices was underneath the, the uh, gravitometer. And in this case, it's an optical, it was one that's used out in the field. It's not one of the fancy ones that you sit at a computer and you see all this, these things. You actually peer in and, and watch the scale going this way. And he's desperately peering in. And next, please. How are we doing? Um, some uh, folk may know about the um, uh, Dave Barrett, uh, or Dave Froning and uh, Barrett's uh, specially conditioned SU2 fields. Um, and I'll just say one thing. yeah, we need I need bigger coils, bigger coils. <laughs> it's like the guy who says, if I only had stronger magnets. That's right. If I only had stronger stro magnets. <laughs> this thing would work. <laughs> if I only had a bigger gyro, if we could spin it faster, <laughs> no, it would work. Power plant next door. Power. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, uh, this is just running through some of the experiments we've done. Actually, we used the gravimeter on, uh, uh, to test the uh, gravitational effects of these new SU2 uh, coil configurations, uh, two of which you see right in here. There's some other ones there, contrawound coils. Uh, and we're out on a, a, a pseudo antenna range um, looking at some of the uh, uh, drop-off characteristics of uh, Barrett's ideas. Next, please. How did that turn out? No excitement, unfortunately. I thought, I thought they had done something back in the 80s when Barrett first came up with those. Yeah, the then we did the better see. experiments. Okay. <laughs> My <laughs> record of a null result is still unbroken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've had more null results <laughs> yes, more per, null results. per year. Yeah. Um, but Kletnov, uh, which I'm sure all you know the, the name, Tony sure does. <laughs> uh, Actually, I'd like to say my no result was better than the other people's That's a good way of putting it. Null, null per, nulls per buck or something? Null, nulls per buck. Nulls per buck were higher than uh, everybody else. He had a double precision null. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> There's Eugene Podkletnov in one of his two visits to our lab um, in 96. And we are looking at an experiment that uh, had been done. We reproduced an experiment done at University of Turin um, in 92, I think, uh, where a spinning YBCO, small spinning superconductor was uh, uh, spinning in the vapors of liquid nitrogen. Uh, it was in the Meissner state, but um, uh, the, the method of, uh, their method of, uh, of um, looking at weight loss was at the undergrad level, I'll put it that way. Um, this looks like it's on undergrad level too, but actually <laughs> uh, we were uh, quite a bit, we, we had quite a bit more precision at the time. Uh, we did not see uh, weight change. There, the the um, cryostats right there, uh, the, the weight, the actual weight is on the end of, this is a chemical balance. Um, we were not able to see a sustained weight loss. There are some strange transient effects uh, when you start to spin up or you slow down suddenly a superconductor, but we could never ascribe them to anything other than uh, instrumentation noise. We weren't able to get that much precision, unfortunately, out of there, out of this, this experiment. But then we went on to make the, uh, uh, the, the larger experiment, the, the reproduction of his spinning superconductor experiment. Uh, the guts of it is down here. Um, the, there are three levitation coils down here, two of which you see prominently. There are the coils if you remember the experiment that loop through the superconductor, it's a superconductor in a ring and it's got a hole in it like a donut and there were to be five megahertz circulating coil, uh, uh, currents induced by three phase coils. Uh, it's all very complicated, uh, but that's the, um, those are the three, three phase coils producing the 
uh, circulating currents. These are the levitation coils, just providing the levitation, but AC levitation, not DC. And this is the gearing mechanism that I used to spin the superconductor, even though, if you think about it, topologically, it had these loops of wire running around it. So that was a nice little challenge, which Podkladnov never, I, I'm convinced he never actually went to all this trouble. Anyway, it was, this is the, uh, the Dewar insert it's called. It's on, this junk here is on the bottom here. We're doing a little bit of liquid nitrogen testing before this whole insert is put into the liquid helium Dewar here. And there are all the three phase everything's um, in the in the 19 inch rack um, amplifiers and uh, matching networks and uh, amplifiers and things like that. Uh, that paper was published uh, in uh, Physica C some time ago. Next, please. So that was all null results. Uh, it was null to the extent that we uh, to the extent of our measurement capabilities. Once again, I cannot say that there's no effect. All I can say is that to the best of our ability, which was 50 times, approximately 50 times better than what he had claimed, we saw a null result. Um, most, I, I suppose most people in the room have also heard about his so-called gravity beam experiment, where he claimed, this is Podkletnov, claimed that at high enough voltage, um, DC voltage, impulse voltage, um, a flash of something magical will be boil off a YBCO superconductor held at liquid nitrogen temperatures, head towards a target, uh, in this case a grounded copper ring with a hole in it, and some magical beam of gravitational force will emanate from the other side of this copper grounded ring. Um, we learned about that experiment. I learned about it uh, when I went over to a lecture he gave. I, I, I don't think anyone else in, in this room was at that lecture uh, back in the 90s when he first proposed, or he said that he had done that experiment, this so-called gravity beam experiment. And so, um, a few years later, when I had some time, uh, we had built these two 600 kV Van de Graaff machines uh, for a different experiment. And so I put together a Podkletnov gravity beam experiment. And in this case, the superconductor is this black thing you can see here. It's glued thermally to a little liquid nitrogen holder there, and there's a, li a, ni a liquid nitrogen dewer inside this dome here. And the target is here, the target uh, um, copper, grounded copper disc. The whole thing is pumped down using uh, all this vacuum system. And we aim this into a Faraday cage or screen room that we have, and we use a very sensitive force detector in that cage. And that was a wire with strips of toilet paper hanging from it. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that is extremely sensitive to, to, to motion. So we were visual, videotaping that and, and firing this thing. And that's what we got. The, the, the moral of this for all of you experimentalists and theorists is if Vladimir Putin finds the secret of anti-gravity or free energy, he is not going to tell you how to do it. Thank you. True is Can you mark that down somewhere? <laughs> uh, first. Okay. Wes. Really? You got it? You should tell them about the little th battery power thing. But also, it's sort of like uh, an asymmetric response, too. I mean, you've got some very large resistance here. But I was wondering about uh, the one that you hadn't uh, mentioned, and that was uh, uh, look, uh, low temperature nuclear fusion. 
Yeah, where did you follow that one at all? Um, can we talk about energy stuff like afterwards? Okay. Well, I just have to try and stick to propulsion sure. at the moment. Um, and I'd be happy to do that. Sir? Uh, uh, this one actually was uh, Murakami of Melt Texture because he had used melt textured in one of his very first so-called gravity beam experiments. Uh, so we made, uh, so this was a three inch diameter melt textured YBCO. Uh, that's what we're using here. But he still, uh, the way he did that, he still did it in a, in a double layer type of fashion. He did a double layer in the gravity beam. He did a double layer in the rotating, the spinning superconductor experiment too. He, he, he actually did three layer stuff too and we did a three layer uh, which was uh, two superconducting layers sandwiched with a, it was a presodymium uh, to, kill the, uh, to kill the superconductor in the middle layer. It, he had all sorts of different kinds that he suggested would be, yeah, that would, that, that'll work. And he actually, he, had a, were, he, he tended to, um, in my opinion, use us here in North America as a tool for him to develop stuff in Russia. And he also had a tendency of not telling you everything. And I, I'm 100% sure that we don't know everything about the experiment, either experiment he did. That, that may, uh, yes, we don't know. That's well, true. How? I was a veteran of many things, of one, of one in particular expedition at Livermore Lab where we were tasked to try to reproduce a Russian result. <laughs> and what we, we, we actually got it to work. A Russian, to their, uh, a Russian uh, result. Russian result. <laughs> Not just this, in this case, Russian. it was done by some very reputable Russian scientists. They published, as usual, it was the Cold War, a very terse article describing vaguely how they got these marvelous results. And we actually got the thing to work, to their amazement and concluded later that the whole thing was a wild goose chase, that they, you know, that we, were, we were doing laser pellets in one dimension, you know, everything converges absolutely spherically in one dimension. If you throw in two dimensional effects, everything goes all over the place, it's like scrambled eggs. But in, two, in one dimension, we could get their stuff to work. And they had left out so much stuff that we kind of just put in by guesswork, um, sure, but we I learned from what? I would say we, we'll probably have some time at the end. Yeah, I'm sorry. Should, uh, I'm just saying the Russians do send people on wild goose chases, and part of it is to bang the system over here. Mm -hmm. They want to see what the reaction is, and also it's to sop up money, any money that actually is working, going toward worthy causes. So, pardon yeah, me. Yeah, and they also are, are interested in knowing what our technical and analytical capabilities are. So, how far are we advanced in? the ability to measure these things, at least this is my particular interest. Where are Russians bearing Yeah. So anyway, uh, I will, I can talk more about Podkletnov because I have some insider information about him too uh, that most people don't know about. Next, please. Uh, this is the Zinsser experiment, which I, I mentioned was a, you might say, an impulse accumulator uh, based on a sawtooth wave into water, into this, into this um, uh, vessel here. The great thing about, or the, the problematic thing about this was that he had explained this and demonstrated this effect at a conference I held uh, in 1991, uh, 1981, holy smokes, in, uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, and he had shown, in fact, that uh, it sure looked like on his balance that he brought over from Germany, um, he was able to uh, have this, this container actually lose weight as, as these impulses, uh, force impulses accumulated uh, in the water. So many years later, actually in 2003, I got around to actually doing the experiment properly. Um, and the experiment properly means having water in a vacuum vessel. So the water has to be contained in a watertight, vacuum-tight vessel. It has to, to, for the impulses to flow into the water, they have to go through these capacitive 
these capacitor plates, which allow the movement of this on of this uh, vessel on a balance beam. The balance beam is along this axis in this uh, large chamber, and there's all sorts of stuff happening. And hidden here is, which actually uh, is is not. It should be up against this wall. Maybe that's it. Is Jim's um, little optical device, which he kindly provided to me, which was a, uh, an optical sensor, a, a, a linear uh, motion uh, detector. And so that was used in this sensor experiment. That's why I put it up. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Next, please. Uh, we are also. Uh, involved with um, uh, uh, experiments to uh, determine relationships between uh, nuclear spins and gravity. And uh, here's an experiment that involves um, EPR, which is uh, uh, the stimulation or the, 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 uh, the uh, orientation of uh, electron spins, which will then by the Overhauser effect, uh, uh, align the nuclear spins in a much more effective way than simply NMR alignment. And that's why there's, uh, there's uh, uh, microwave activity going on here and uh, uh, very, very sensitive vacuum balance, another vacuum system. And this whole thing is uh, uh, cryostatically cooled. So we have those kinds of capabilities too. Um, so far, this is an experiment that is underway. There are no results from that experiment yet. Next, please. And finally, here is John Hutchison himself. Um, I, I bring him up because of what Lance had mentioned earlier, namely you can have experiments and no theory and by God there's no theory to explain this guy <laughs> or how any of the, uh, the stuff associated with him and I had lots of questions um, as uh, before the uh, talk started here um, what do you think of it was Hutchison real is he is he real and all I can say in the very brief time that I have, Hutchison was real at the time of the events that are described in this book. Hutchison is not real now. What do you mean now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. John Hutchison was able to levitate and break apart and cause all sorts of other weird things happening which are described in the book at the time that we were researching them. We had a contract to find out what the hell was going on with this guy and we tried our best. We never were able to discover what was going on but we witnessed and experienced the most unusual things that I've ever experienced in all my years being uh, at this game. You couldn't replicate it. Design. We couldn't, but we set up the, ex this, we can go into this offline, but we set up the experiment ourselves just the way he did in a different location. We got some electrostatic effects, but only when he came and performed the experiments was there actual levitation. Like that. Excuse me. So, so on, on an independently constructed apparatus, he was able to operate it and get the. Effects. Yes. Yes. Um, the the reason I'm bringing this up is is that uh, we're going we're all talking about the technical aspects of advanced propulsion. You know, we've got theories, we've got um, we've got quantum mechanics, and we've got. Sorry, I, I'm not. I didn't think we could, we've got relativity, we've got quantum mechanics, and we've got experiments, and, and all the stuff that I'm testing and that you guys have gone through. Um, I just want to 
just put in the very back of your mind the fact that consciousness may play a role. Next, please. And there's, there's Jim, enough said. <laughs> uh, next, please. Okay. So, so Jim's works. So out of all these guys you see, nothing. But then there's Jim, so that works. Um, you didn't say anything, so I'm asking. I, I'm saying that I've seen a very small effects which I believe are just outside the noise uh, in my reproduction, in my thrust balance using one of Jim's older first or second generation devices. What, what, but what it's device very device? small. Was it, was it the stack? Was it PCT? Was it a very old What? PCT. Jim's. You see, it, it's a device that's the same as the one that Devo tested. And up until I don't know if you were in the setup we had before. It's been that device has been changed, as you know, we say the reaction mass was changed to the last. Okay. And yeah. It produced much better effects. So. And indeed, did, did I need to do the. Sitting right there on the table. Aha. Uh -huh. We're distributing what? new reaction masses yeah. to George and. Do I owe you 20 bucks for this? No, <laughs> 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 40. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the spikes and stuff that you saw that Gary put up that produced the device that's supposed to be the new device. And those are the reaction masses that should make it possible for them to see the same sort of effects. Um, George, just to follow on though, what he was saying, so uh, everything was a null result. I set aside GMs, but all those other guys was the null, except for this weird Hutchinson thing. Is that yes, you could say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's go on. I think we've already passed through a bunch of this. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, sorry. So. Uh, George, have you ever tried LANR? Uh, yes, we have. Not in our lab, but in, uh, down in uh, Texas, in Austin. And we'll we talk about the uh, energy stuff later, um, if if it that's what you're referring to. I, d I don't know of any propulsive effects of low energy nuclear reactions, cold fusion, whatever you want to call it. 